Hello, I'm Larry Warren, Research Chair at Clear Passage Physical Therapy. The following film is an overview, an in-depth look at the history of our treatment for the adhesions that are the general cause of small bowel obstructions, how we arrived at this therapy, and the studies that have been published around it, along with our success rates. I hope you find it educational. This video will look at small bowel obstructions, both the fact that they are a terrible curse and also an actual cure for small bowel obstructions. And you'll see what we mean. When small bowel obstructions begin, you cannot help but notice them. There's terrible pain. You feel like you're going to throw up. There's really nothing you can do. You know if this has happened to you before that if it passes, it's going to come back. And eventually, if it's bad enough, and you will know, you're going to take a trip to the emergency room. They will admit you if it has not passed, and you will wait for days, and then possibly undergo surgery. We know from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services that the average hospital stay is 14 days with no food, no water, you have hydration, narcotics, and nutrition intravenously. That is all the nutrition that you get. You're allowed to suck on some ice if they're generous with you, but that's it. Um, then, part we all remember, if we've gone through this, you insert a nasogastric tube through your nose down into your stomach where it pumps out the contents of your stomach, and they tape that in you, and you have it on 24-7 for your entire hospital stay. It is a very uncomfortable situation. While you're staying there, you are wondering, am I going to have a repeat surgery? Am I going to have a repeat bowel obstruction? How likely is that? Am I, is this going to kill me? So you're waiting, wondering, praying, and you really, your life is on hold. Everything is waiting until you're diagnosed with either, hey, it cleared, or we're going to take you into surgery. If you're lucky, at some point they actually can hear some bowel sounds. You have pass a little bit of gas, or, and your doctor and nurse is saying, you know what, it's passed. We're going to discharge you from the hospital. Great, you say, that's terrific. I'm glad I can go home. And then the doctor says, well, know that the obstruction has passed for now. Physiologically, nothing has changed in you. You have the exact same gut. Um, it's possible and perhaps probable that you'll be back here again, but you're good to go for now. Gee, thanks. On the other hand, if it turns out you have to undergo surgery, the doctor will go in there, resect, that is remove that part of the bowel which is blocked and join the two ends. Hope like heck that nothing in your bowel spills out before they seal you back up because then you would create a situation called peritonitis where you have an infection in between your organs. Um, they'll have to open you back up again. We'll talk about that in a moment and the frequency of that. Um, if the, everything goes just great. The doctor says, I managed to clear the obstructions, um, but we know that adhesions from surgery are the number one cause of bowel obstruction, so y you're liable to be back here again. So whichever way you go, you are not left with the feeling that everything is totally resolved. Again, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, 18% of people, about one out of five, return to the hospital within 30 days after their bowel obstruction surgery. The unlucky ones, about one in 14, die with surgery. After surgery, about one out of five patients return to the hospital within 30 days, according to the U.S. government statistics. A lot of that is from an inadvertent enterotomy where the physician could not see well because of adhesions or for other reasons and by mistake cut through an organ or part of an organ that was healthy 
um, or a bit of the contents of the ballast build out during the resection and when you were closed up the bacteria that were left in a warm, moist, dark environment in your body started to proliferate. Three days later, you were in terrible pain after being discharged. You go back to the hospital. Oh gosh, you have developed peritonitis, an internal infection that's quite serious. We're going to have to open you up with a laparotomy, an open surgery, and pour antibiotics into you. About 1 in 14 patients actually die during the surgery or quickly thereafter. So that's a 7% rate. The Journal of the American Medical Association recently came out with a study and found that bowel obstruction surgery was not only the second most common emergency surgery in the United States, but the one with the highest complication rate, 47%. Again, a lot of that from inadvertent enterotomy. Bit of a warning here, here's a, about a 15 second clip of a bowel obstruction surgery. Again, according to the Journal of the American Medical Association, the risk of death after bowel obstruction surgery is about 1 in 15. After laparotomy, all laparotomies, including gunshot wounds and such like that, uh, the risk of death is 1 in 4. So either way, it's a pretty serious situation when they have to cut you open and go deeply inside of you to repair situations can be a challenge for your physicians, certainly. The primary cause of bowel obstructions, we know, is adhesions, adhesions that form naturally after surgery, which is again related to the primary cause of bowel obstruction. As a matter of fact, an exhaustive study of 250,000 patients over five decades found these rates for adhesion formation following surgeries. Here we see a clean abdomen with no adhesions. Uh, adhesions can form first in the pelvis or wherever the cut is and then can spread over time throughout the body. They don't go away. They tend to remain in place or to grow over time. When a bowel obstruction occurs, the bowel can be kinked by adhesions, like kinking a garden hose, and that can stop food from going through. In the case of SIBO, it can stop bacteria from exiting the body once it's treated. Um, it is less common, but adhesions can form within the actual intestine itself, adhering that and stopping again the progress of food through your body. Adhesions can cause what is called a stricture. This is a narrowing of the intestines, squeezing it down like an hourglass shape, preventing food from going through. Those can occur from the outside, as shown here. Adhesions can form within the wall of the intestine, causing them to constrict down into a stricture. Your surgeon cannot actually see that, but she or he can see the results in an x-ray. Here we see an x-ray of an hourglass shaped stricture adhesion. The bowel has narrowed down just like an hourglass at the point of that arrow. Some of the other organs around are also quite adhered. You can't immediately see that. This woman was scheduled for emergency surgery but came to us instead and we did some of the work that we were doing to open blocked fallopian tubes. After we treated her, you can see the results on the right that bowel totally opened and she was judged as having a normal bowel. 
you can see the other aspects of the bowel, not just the ones at the point of the arrow, how they have opened up significantly as well. In the same patient, she had a stricture that was narrowed like a coffee straw for three inches. Nothing was going to go through her intestines except a tiny bit of the tracer that she, they had her swallow. However, after we saw her, we were able to open that stricture, clear those bowels, clear the space, and afterwards the radiologist said she has a normal bowel and she avoided the surgery. So what had happened? Well, we developed a manual treatment to treat chronic pain patients, but we were totally focused on adhesions. So how did we do this and could we repeat this time and again? We are a very serious physical therapy facility and we needed to know if we could measure this and test it so that we could look people in the eye, this is a life-threatening condition, and say yes we think we can help you or no we don't think we can. It's very important to us. We wanted to know if we could produce these results and predict the effectiveness, this is potentially life-saving therapy, we realized. Really, to find the answer, we must go back in time and look at the history of how we came upon this and how we developed this particular work. This adventure is at once scientific, which is very important to us. It is also called fascinating by a lot of people, and certainly it is a heartfelt adventure when you realize that this started long, long ago. This is my wife and I at her second birthday. I was five at the time. Um, we grew up together as childhood friends and became sweethearts. In 1975, she graduated top of her class at the University of Florida Physical Therapy School, um, did very well as a clinical instructor of physical therapy and treating quite a few patients. In 1984, as we were preparing to marry, she developed pelvic cancer at the age of 33. It was a very scary time for us. The doctors recommended a very aggressive treatment where they took some stainless steel balls and a stainless steel tube, filled them with irradiated material inserted them surgically the full depth of her uterus, placed her in a lead-lined room, said, I'm sorry, it's dangerous for us to be in this room for more than five minutes at a time to bring you food, but we're going to have you here for 72 hours so that this radiation can really zap that cancer and cure you. In the end, Sure enough, between surgery at her cervix and that radiation therapy, her cancer was cured, but the cost to her was severe. Her uterus was destroyed by the radiation therapy, was her entire reproductive system. Perhaps the worst of it for her was she said, Larry, I have just debilitating pelvic pain. I can't walk, move, or breathe without pain. Uh, this is really killing me. Doctors told her, well, no, you understand that. You have severe adhesions now. Your organs are all glued together. So um, surgery won't help. You really don't want us doing surgery there. We're just going to create more adhesions. You're just going to have to learn to live with that pain. Well, we couldn't accept that edict of nothing can be done. So we started studying adhesions. We were not at all thinking of bowel obstructions at the time and will not have been for another 10 or 12 years, as you will quickly see. What we did learn was that adhesions are formed by very strong strands of collagen, shown here in white. Like the strands of a nylon rope, they can attach to each other and get their strength through attaching to each other, and that there is a molecular chemical bond that attaches each of those strands to the underlying structure, whether it is a uterus, a part of the bowel, a blood vessel, or a nerve. 
as we studied them more, we realized that not only does the molecular chemical bond give them their strength, but it may be a vulnerable point. We know that adhesions are so strong, these little white strands, we can't break them. Maybe we could detach these bonds from each other and in doing so, free and unravel these adhesions, kind of like pulling out the run in a three-dimensional sweater. So we developed a therapy to detach these bonds and adhesions. As we worked on Belinda, she found she was able to work. She worked with a new passion. We started treating patients with severe chronic pain. And so many of them did so well after therapy that we started becoming flooded with physician-referred patients for chronic pain. While we were treating these and trying to keep up with the numerous physician requests for therapy, something unusual happened. As we were treating in the pelvis of infertile women, those with fallopian tubes that had been blocked for several years started reporting pregnancies. We were shocked at first, we couldn't understand it. We realized that adhesions are the primary cause of tubal blockage. You can kind of see where I'm going with this now for your bowel obstructions. At that point, we advised the physicians in our town, a very medical town at the University of Florida Medical School, that we were having the success. The chief of staff of the hospital called me in and said, what is this, Mr. Warren, about opening black fallopian tubes? I said, well, here's some charts. Take a look at them. He looked at them. He looked at one, then looked at another. He said, my God, sir, you were doing things with your hands. I don't think I could do surgically. And I'm an excellent surgeon, and he was. He said, are you doing any research? No. Would you like to? Yes. Well, really, we need to investigate this further. We realized that with fallopian tubes, we could inject a dye and follow the dye radiographically by x-ray and see if the tube was open, such as the one on the left here, or if the dye only went a little way into it, such as the one on the right. So we could see the x-ray before and after therapy, that before therapy, the organ was actually squeezed by adhesions and no dye is coming out. The white is the dye in this case. Here the white, again, is the interior of the uterus, now wide open, no longer squeezed by adhesions, and the dye comes pouring out. It's called free spillage. This is exactly what you want. This woman can go out and conceive naturally. So again, here's the before and after images for the fallopian tubes and also for the uterus. The same thing as it happens occurs in the intestines. We're getting there. An NIH researcher heard from his son, a physician in our town, Dad, you have to come see what these people are doing with their hands. It's amazing. They're opening blocked fallopian tubes. So with that NIH researcher, he moved into town to study us, and we published our first little in-house study. Some of them were very severe cases of blockage where this tube that is only designed to carry a single cell, an egg, or a few sperm, which are much smaller than the eggs, it gets clogged and blocked by adhesions, and these delicate little flower petals at the end get pulled together, and we treated patients like this, and they would have multiple children. This woman had only one tube, but her tube looked just like the one in the prior slide. And she had a little girl and then had twins, all naturally after we treated. We published several studies in medical journals on treating blocked fallopian tubes and female infertility. Most of our studies have been published and housed in the U.S. National Library of Medicine, housed by the National Institutes of Health. Um, naturally, we are serious healthcare professionals. I mean, we were opening blocked fallopian tubes manually. It was big news that one of the authors was the chief of staff of the hospital, the other is a biostatistician, the head of biostatistics at the University of Florida Medical School is one of our authors. Um, in one study, we opened blocked fallopian tubes and we studied 28 patients there. Another follow-up study a few years later 
235 patients, so we're starting to get the hang of creating good, credible scientific data so we could look people in the eye and say this is what we can do and this is what we can't do. When we started publishing these, it caught the attention of some patients with recurring bowel obstructions and these were patients who, like so many of ours, were in quite serious condition. The first was a singer in California who called us. She said, you know, I've had seven abdominal surgeries in 30 months. Most of them were wide open surgeries, not laparoscopies. Five of them were to decrease adhesions and four included repair of small bowel obstructions. She had the usual symptoms that small bowel obstruction patients have, the pain, the nausea, the vomiting, no solid food. She said, now they're scheduling my eighth surgery. They're gonna remove not only adhesions, but half or a third of my stomach. This is called a Whipple procedure, very major surgery. They're gonna remove my gallbladder, the upper parts of my small intestine, including my duodenum and my proximal jejunum. Can you possibly help me? I know they want to help me. They're killing me. I need something different. We told her what we did and said we would do our best. And when she arrived, she was in very severe pain, very weak, uh, totally liquid diet for about six weeks and had lost a significant amount of her body weight. We instituted a five-day program, 20 hours of therapy, just four hours a day of a hands-on therapy, two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. By Wednesday evening, my wife and I took her to dinner and she had some solid food. She reported a significant pain decrease. She actually regained all of her weight when she went home and did an in-service for her surgeon and her medical team that was following her, telling them about what we do here. It's now been over 11 years and she has not had a surgery for bowel obstruction or anything close to it since. Uh, she did come back one more time for 20 hours of therapy, but she was a very severe case. Other cases were similarly severe. So many of our patients were so complicated. Woman came in, she said, can you help me? I cannot ingest food, as a matter of fact, Virtually all of my nutrition is intravenous. So she was in serious condition, clearly. She could have a little bit of liquid, nothing solid. She had no quality of life, couldn't travel. Um, just in horrible shape. I didn't know what we could do with her, but the poor lady, she was having an obstruction. She said, anything you can do that might help would be wonderful. Again, we did 20 hours of our manual therapy over five days. It feels like a really deep massage, but it's very site-specific to adhered areas, which we determine by reading surgical reports and mainly by palpating and feeling what's going on and then addressing those cross-links that I referred to earlier. After treatment, her physician was shocked. She was able to remove the IV lines because the woman was able to eat normally. She regained her quality of life. I actually did a film of her that you can see on the website. Um, and she said, Larry, I just had a cheeseburger and I'm going to Cancun next week with my husband. So it was just a shocking turnaround. Other patients that we saw were so severe. Treated a young man who fell asleep in the back seat of the car his brother was driving, woke up when, after his brother ran head on into a large tree, and our patient was found himself impaled on the gear shift knob between the two front bucket seats. It was life flighted away to a hospital where they performed multiple surgeries, uh, kept having bowel obstructions. These are the kind of patients that we see we published studies on so many of these patients. In this case, a young lad was run over by the rear tires of his school bus such that it split his pelvis open like a book. Amazing that he even lived. Uh, they rushed him to the hospital. He had 14 surgeries, 
before we saw him, more were planned. Um, we treated him for bowel obstruction and for other conditions which were related to adhesions. You can read about in the study, um, ascended testicle, it would not drop down due to adhesions. His, after we treated him, they canceled the additional planned surgeries because they didn't need them. So if, again, this is in the National Institutes of Health, National Library of Medicine, this study, if you think you have a complicated case or your relative or friend is a complicated case and can these people possibly treat me, this is what we cut our teeth on. This is, this is where we started with bowel obstructions. I cannot tell you how gratifying it was to save these people's lives and to turn their lives around. And it led us into creating more studies. We actually created a validated questionnaire because we realized quality of life is so important to those of you who have recurring bowel obstructions, wondering when is this going to happen again. It's like an anvil over my head. Every time I look in the mirror in the morning, I'm wondering, is this the day I'm going to obstruct, be taken to a hospital? I'm afraid to travel. I'm afraid to go across town to my sister's for dinner. I might end up in the hospital. Um, so we use that questionnaire to gather quality of life uh, responses in patients that we're treating as we're working ourselves up through some x-ray studies into a major study, a huge controlled study. Uh, we had by this time hundreds of referring physicians. Many of them were fascinated. We did develop some interest from physicians at major medical schools at Harvard and Stanford, Washington, University of Florida and, Al and Arizona all got together to write studies about what we were doing to simply help prevent this. We started with a prospective efficacy study, then got x-ray images of the patient that I showed you before, before and after shots of this woman's intestines who was scheduled for emergency surgery, was able to cancel her surgery because a radiologist said she has clear intestines afterwards. We knew from very prestigious journals that adhesions are a major cause in medicine. 40 to 66 percent of elective procedures in abdominal surgery are reoperations, mainly to destroy adhesions. Adhesions frequently form after surgery. Seen a five-decade study of over 250,000 patients, and this is what they found as far as adhesion formation after pelvic and abdominal surgery. We knew that post-surgical adhesions are the most common cause of bowel obstruction, and that repeat surgery increases the risk of adhesions, obstructions, and more surgery. And your physician has not told you this. Um, they probably have. Uh, just ask them. We also realize that nothing in medicine really addresses the internal adhesions and the risk of subsequent obstructions in a non-surgical way. We ask ourselves, was there really a way to stop this vicious cycle that so many of our patients were in of surgery, then adhesions, then another obstruction? then another surgery for that one, then more adhesions, then another obstruction. We realized how important it was to stop this cycle, and so did the physicians at those august universities I named a few minutes ago. So together with them, we created a phase two control study. Phase two meaning there are more than 100 patients in each arm of the study. Controlled means that over 100 of them we treated and 100 of them were the norm. They did not get any of the clear passage treatment, which is the norm. And um, we published the study. 
It published in the very prestigious journal, the World Journal of Gastroenterology. Because this is an extensive and very important study, I'm going to give you a thorough look into it. We compared the control group that did not receive therapy versus those that did for the incidence of repeat bowel obstructions, total and partial, repeat surgeries, quality of life, which we could now measure through a validated, validated test, and the costs. There are over 100 patients in each group, which made it a phase two study, which is a good seal of approval from the scientific community. Looking at the complexity of the groups coming into the study, the controls, the ones we did not treat, were averaged 36 years old. The ones that we did treat averaged a bit over 54 years old. So the therapy group that we treated was quite a bit older. Uh, the therapy group also had twice as many surgeries, so you would have expected us not to do as well with the therapy group as with the controls. Uh, years impacted by small bowel obstruction basically double for the ones that we treated versus the controls. So these were some complicated patients. Uh, those with prior partial small bowel obstructions, uh, again, about twice as many in the therapy group. As I mentioned in the results, we looked at the number of recurring obstructions and number of surgeries afterwards that need quality of life issues. We also looked at range of motion because adhesions do restrict a person's their ability to move. What we found was for the partial bowel obstructions after we treated them and we followed them for a period of months, the controls had two and a half times as many partial bowel obstructions as the therapy group. Partial meaning you were obstructed, you may or may not have gone to the hospital, it finally cleared on its own, you didn't have to have surgery. Even though the controls were much more complicated in their histories, the therapy group had about two and a half times less partial obstructions. The group that we treated had 15 times fewer total obstructions as the norm. This is the 14.52% is what we see in the general population once we treated these patients who were having recurring obstructions. There were less than 1%. The uh, p-values you see on the side is a statistical value. Statisticians will have noticed that. That means there were three chances out of 10,000 that this could have occurred by chance. Repeat surgeries, the control groups had about three times as many repeat surgeries as the therapy group. Every good study measures adverse events. We already know that for emergency bowel obstruction, there is a 47% complication rate that just for run-of-the-mill hospitalization and surgery, 18% are readmitted to the hospital within 30 days, um, generally for adhesions. Um, and in our case, we didn't have anything like that. Our events were temporary and not harmful. Tenderness, aching, hip or back pain were the three that people reported, but those symptoms went away pretty quickly. Clearly, in examining therapy versus the norm, we see no surgery with therapy, no NG tube, that nasogastric tube in your, through your nose down into your stomach, pumping out your stomach contents, no narcotics, no IVs for medication, narcotics, or nutrition. As a matter of fact, no hospitalization at all. And we instruct each of our patients in a self-treatment regime. Walking out of therapy, patients report fewer or zero surgeries, fewer or zero obstructions, 
fewer or zero hospitalizations after therapy. We're not magicians. We don't succeed with everyone, but the percentage of success is overwhelming and undeniable. Patients leave with a greater comfort because they have increased knowledge of what's going on, what's causing their adhesions. They have a self-treatment program we give them so that they can treat their adhesions and keep them at bay themselves. If something comes up and they're on vacation in Europe or at an island somewhere, if something comes up, they know how to treat themselves to get things clear and get back to their lives. And frankly, just knowing that there is a non-surgical treatment for small bowel obstruction is a great comfort to the patients that we see. Helps them avoid all of this situation. We thank you for watching. I hope this has been elucidating and a bit fascinating for you and giving you some good knowledge so that you can step forward in life with a real knowledge base, understanding more about small bowel obstructions, about the role of adhesions in small bowel obstructions, about how adhesions can be addressed, both surgically and via non-surgical therapy, so that you can make some decisions for yourself to give yourself back the quality of life that you want. We wish you the best. Thank you so much.